Hello, and welcome to the APEX webinar, Beyond the Horizon, Sensing in Your Supply Chain, Creating Short-Term Stability and Positioning for Long-Term Change, with Dr. Stephen A. Melnick. My name is Jennifer Storelli, Associate Editor at APEX. Please note this presentation is being recorded and will be available at apex.org slash online events starting early next week. Before we begin, I'd like to run through a few details. At the end of the presentation, we will save time for a question and answer session. If you look at the GoToWebinar toolbar on your screen, you'll see a questions box. To ask your question at any time during the presentation, simply type it in the box and click send. Should you experience any technical difficulties during today's broadcast, please call GoToWebinar tech support at 1-805-617-7000. Again, that's 1-805-617-7000. And now it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Stephen A. Melnick. Steve, you may begin. Thank you, Jennifer, and welcome to this session. Uh, it's my pleasure to talk about this, and in fact, what we're going to introduce you to is some new developments that we began to uncover at Michigan State University as part of our Beyond the Horizon and Research Initiative. And in order to understand this, first of all, let me make an observation. If you have any questions or if you wish to get some more information, uh, please don't hesitate to contact me and this information will be made available again at the end of the presentation. By the way, before I go any further, I'd like to acknowledge Laura Ciceri, who has kindly shared with me both her thoughts and some of her information and data that she's generated at her site called Supply Chain Insights. I can't thank her enough and for not only sharing the data, but also sharing her thoughts with me. And a lot of what you see here reflects our interaction. Well, what are we going to talk about today? Well, we're going to start by asking a simple question. Why do we need sensing and why do we need sensing now? We're going to show you that it's really being forced upon us. And organizations that lack the ability to sense are right off the bat going to put themselves into a competitive disadvantage. The second thing we're going to talk about is we're going to define this concept called sensing. And we're going to show you examples of how organizations are dealing with it. This is not a theory. This is not something that's written about in textbooks. This is being done by organizations. Some as diverse as Rubbermaid, the American Red Cross, Lenovo, and the British Columbia uh, health, health system. In order to do that, we're going to start with a historical analogy, and then we're going to ask the question, how do we develop it? And finally, we're going to stop by asking a simple question, what does this mean for the future supply chain manager? And here, we're going to show you that there's a fundamental transformation taking place in the supply chain manager. And that means that you're going to have to learn certain skills and that these skills are going to become important in the next five to ten years. All right. Well, if you've heard me before, and some of you have, this is one slide I love to use over and over again because it emphasizes one of the realities that other functions in business don't seem to understand. And that's the reality of supply chain management. What is that? Well, it's a simple reality. Today's supply chain is the result of investments made in the past. Every one of you knows it takes time to change supply chains. It takes time to build new capabilities. So what you're faced by today is the result of what you've done in the past. However, if that's the case, then we have to recognize that what we're going to do today is going to influence the, your supply chain in the future. And that's a reality that you can't get away from. So the reality is we have to forecast. We have to start thinking of the future. Every supply chain manager who is good that I've ever encountered is always thinking of the future. Well, in order to do this, I want to introduce you to something. Some of you, I hope, went to were present at the 2016 APEX International Conference. On the first day, during the plenary, Abe Eskenazi, the CEO of Apex, introduced the RISE. It was a videotape which identified nine major developments which were, going, which were seen as shaping the supply chain of the future. 
And the importance of this was fairly simple. Uh, these are going to define the directions, issues that Apex as an organization is going to focus on. Well, I'm going to leave you to look at it, and it's available from Apex. It's also available on YouTube. But during the course of the presenting these nine various developments, three became really interesting and are critical to this presentation. And they're going to be the rise of big data. And we're going to talk about how organizations are now being flooded by information. Not by information, by data. And that's going to be a fact of life. Life. Beyond mere automation, where we're talking about the rise of smart technology. And the third thing, and one that's really critical, is the rise of speed. Well, let's kind of take these apart and understand what's going on, because it's kind of important for you to see what's going on. Let's start with the rise of data. Well, the rise of data really talks about the fact that we are now dealing in an environment where we have more and more information, data. In part, this is due to a new development known as the Internet of Things. Now, what's the Internet of Things? The Internet of Things is something fairly straightforward. These are physical objects or things that are embedded with software, sensors, and network connectivity that enable the IoT to collect, exchange, and analyze data. And think about what you've got. They're smart devices. Just for a moment, think how many smart devices you and I use. Well, we have a computer. And we have a phone. If you have an iPhone or a gear, uh, that's a smart device. Uh, we may have a Fit monitor. Uh, we may have Alexa from Amazon. Well, what's interesting is that these are becoming pervasive. They're being fitted into smartphones, cars. Uh, they're being they're being fit into sensors. They're being fitted into equipment, appliances, fitness monitors, etc. What they're doing right now is they are automating the collection of data. And what's interesting is the fact that it's estimated that by 2020 we will have over two and a two two and over two, 20 billion devices. Now, what's really interesting about this statistic is the newest uh, IP protocol, IP6, it has more addresses than there are grains of sand on the surface of the Earth. And we're going to need it for this new development. So what does this mean? Well, this means every we are going to be inundated with data we're gonna, about everything. I was talking with someone from a trucking company who informed me that every time the truck moved, how many times they're sensing it. And we're going to have to do, deal with that data. And the problem is it's a challenge dealing with it. Com compounding this is we're going to go beyond mere automation. And what do we mean by this? We're going to mean we're going to have smart automation. We're starting to see it right now, self-driving cars. Right now, companies like Ford, um, Tesla, are stating that by 2020, every car and truck that they produce will have to have the ability to be self-driving. To give you an idea that it's a reality, at the 2016 car show in Detroit, Michigan, the Mercedes-Benz introduced the 2017 E-Class, which was described as the most connected car ever built. And the point that it's really important to understand is that these are dealing, the technology is not only the data there, but it's being incorporated. And then finally, this is one I want to spend some time on, the rate of change. The rate of change in the world, as pointed out by John Potter, is going up today, and it's going up fast, and it's affecting organizations. And in fact, we have a term for this. If you go to Europe, people refer to this as the fourth industrial revolution. In fact, in Europe, it's just simply called Industry 4.0. And what is it? Notice the discussion here. And this, again, comes directly from the rise. Industry 4.0 is characterized by a wide range of new technologies that are infusing the physical, digital, and biological worlds, impacting all disciplines, economies, and industries, and even, even challenging ideas about what it means to be human. So what does this mean to you? Let me give you something. This again came from Laura. From Laura.
where she did a presentation a couple of weeks ago, and in it she talked about that certain things which are hot now, such as the uh, business analytics, are not going to be hot in the future. Notice what's going to be hot in the future. And we're talking 2030, Internet of Things, 3D printing, robotics. And what is this talking about? The change is occurring. So what's the reality? Well, we're living in a world characterized by increasing rates of technology and change. Market leaders, and this is really interesting, are becoming purposely disruptive. But consider Amazon, for example. Amazon is disruptive because it keeps changing how it works with its customers. The best example is what happened this year with, uh, with, cyber, with Black Cyber Weekend week, where customers were not only able to log online, but they could use, they could talk to their smart devices, such as the uh, Amazon Tap, and ask them what were the specials of the day. They're also disruptive to competitors. Now, let me be very honest. Before you dismiss this statement and think that it only applies to B2C, business to consumer, don't go there. Last year, I was a keynote speaker at the uh, Strategic Supply Chain Summit Conference in Chicago, Illinois. And I was the closing keynote speaker. But as I sat and listened, as I prepared for my presentation, I had a chance to listen to a panel consisting by three manufacturing companies that made equipment for businesses. And one of them described what he called the Amazon effect. And there what he said is that he was getting ready to sign a contract with a customer, and the customer asked him a simple question. Uh, we're going to buy your equipment. Great. What's going to happen if, if it has a problem on Friday night? Well, he said, you just simply send us an email, fill in the form, and we'll get to it next business day. The person stopped, put his pen down, and said, no. I want you to be like Amazon. What do you mean? If I have a problem, even on a Sunday night at 11 o'clock, I can pick up the phone and somebody's going to be there. I want you to do that. And he had to respond. And the other factor that makes Amazon market leaders disruptive is they're even disruptive to their supply chain partners. Consider the fact that Amazon depends upon the United States Postal Service and FedEx for its logistics. But now FedEx is sending fairly strong signals that it's going to build its own logistics system. This is your partner, and you're telling them you're going to be in competition with them? This is not to be, this cannot be underestimated. Okay, what do I mean we're living in a second derivative world? Okay, this is the business professor coming out to me. How many of you remember calculus? That was Sir Isaac Newton's revenge on the English-speaking world. In uh, calculus, if you had a first derivative, which was zero, that said it was a constant. If you had a first derivative which was not equal to zero, there was some change taking place. But if the second derivative was equal to zero, it was a constant change. When we tell, when I say that we're living in a second derivative world, what I'm really saying is we're living in an environment where change is occurring at an accelerating rate. And this is one theme that was mentioned repeatedly at the 2016 APEX conference. Well, so what? That's probably a good question. And in order to understand this, I'm going to give you a historical analogy. I'm going to argue that where we are in supply chain management is very similar to where the United States Air Force was in 1952. Let me tell you what happened then. In 1952, the United States, along with Canada, Great Britain, and other countries, was engaged in the police action, otherwise known as the Korean War. What we had done from 1945, which was the end of World War II, to 1950, which was the beginning of the Korean War, is we had seen a significant shift in air technology. In, the 19, in World War II, the primary method was the prop-driven aircraft, and the epitome of that was the P-51 Mustang. The Mustang fought at about 450 miles per hour, which meant two planes coming at each other came at about 900. Well, we saw something different. And in, in the 1950s, because of technology, such as the jet engine, the swept wing, 
and the, the slab elevator, we saw airplanes overcoming compressibility and moving into the six to 700 miles per hour range. So that meant two airplanes would close on each other at between 12 to 1400 miles per hour. In 1952, the United States Air Force looked at its fatalities and they were shocked. They found out that they were very bimodal. There was two lumps. Its pilots either got shot down very quickly or they survived for a good long time and at which point it was random odds caught up to them, whatever, and they got shot down. This perplexed them because the United States Air Force at this time had the best fighter pilot arguably in the world. That's the F-86 that you see here, the, super, the Sabre. It also had some of the best trained pilots in the world. So how could this be? In order to do this, they called upon a true out-of-the-box thinker, a guy by the name of Colonel John R. Boyd. Now, if you want to know anything about military history, here is a man who has had a profound impact on military history. And what's interesting about John R. Boyd, he was the epitome of an out-of-the-box thinker. So much so that he never rose above colonel, even though his impact on air fight, air combat was significant. And this is John R. Boyd. He looked at the situation and he came up with a simple observation. The technology has changed. We can't wait to be certain. And what he, was, what he found is that those pilots who got shot down quickly waited until they were certain of the enemy before they acted. By that time, because you were closing at 12 to 1400 miles per hour, it was too late. You were essentially no longer a victor, you were a victim. And his response was to come up with the OODA loop, which was observe, orient, deploy, act, which has become the basis of air combat across the world. Well, what does that got to do with supply chain? I'm going to argue we're in the same situation. And what we have to think about is rethinking how we manage. And we're going to see this theme re reintroduced at the end of the session. And we call it the strategic response cycle. And what do we mean by that? Well, what we mean is we have to do the following. Number one, we have to be able to sense new developments. We have to know quickly what's on the horizon. We have to get that information into ourselves as quickly as possible. The second thing is, we have to assess it. Is it important now? Is it important in the future? What should we do with it? If we deem it to be important, we have to formulate a response. Once we've got it, then we have to deploy it. Now, by the way, now what we have to do is recalibrate. What does that mean? Well, as a result of the prior four actions, we may find that our original goals and objectives are either are no longer feasible. Either we've achieved them and passed them, or else we can't achieve them. So we have to think about where we're going to go to next. Then we have to learn. And here what you're doing is you're looking at three things. What went right? What went wrong? What was missing? And by the way, learning is important. Um, I've heard several people say that in today's environment, the successful manager has to master three skills. The skill of learning, what's new. The skill of unlearning, what no longer works. And the skill of relearning, what we've forgotten, but we should re remember. And then finally, repeat. Now, what's interesting are two features. Number one, this is very much a future-orientated system. In fact, if you go to Europe, they refer to this as forward casting. And what the focus is, we can't do anything about the past. Let's focus on the future. As one manager put it to me, he said, the past is done, the future is yet to be written. Let me focus on what I can affect. But you know what's interesting about this cycle? It's got to be done fast. Now, where this really impressed me is, last year, Nick, a little colleague of mine and myself, we went, visited a company in the Midwest which was engaged extensively in Omni Channel. And as part of our visit, we were taken around the warehouse, and towards the end of the plant tour, the person who was taking us around, who was a fairly senior level manager in the company, stopped and he pointed to a new line, and he said, this line represented a $1.7 million investment for the company. I was suitably impressed. Once you get beyond six 
figures, I get impressed. And I asked, and he said, asked us, how long do you think us, you think it took us, our organization, to go from being aware of it to having that in place? Well, I responded, two years. The, guy, the manager, the tour guide stopped, looked at me, and he shook his head and said, no, seven months. From the time we were aware, we had sensed the need until we had implemented the system. And I was kind of shocked. Well, what would happen if it was the wrong investment? And he had some, said something which really emphasizes this concept of fast management, which is what you see here. He said, by the time we had been sure, it would have been too late. The competition would have been past us. And what he was getting to is the importance of this. And to do this, we have to sense because it is required for the new supply chain. Now, this is, again, a very brief presentation. I'm going to sh kind of summarize some of the developments we've, we're seeing taking place right now, which is underlying the concept that the supply chain is changing. And what are they? Uh, there's an increasing rate of technology. There's an acceptance of complexity as a business driver. Uh, increasingly, we heard managers say to us, Complexity is no longer something we can avoid. We have to embrace it. By the way, uh, we have to embrace it while getting rid of complexity, uh, uh, complications. There are new business pressures, such as the Amazon effect we've talked about. Uh, there are new ways of dealing with the customers, such as omnichannel, which is where however the customer wants to order from us, we got to be there. We're starting to see that the supply chain is no longer oriented around cost. Increasingly, we're looking at managers who are talking about responsiveness, sustainability, resilience. How about security? If there is an area where supply chain is going to have to address in the near future directly and head on, it is security. We have seen so many examples of security being violated in the supply chain that we are now becoming aware of the need for cybersecurity, not within the firm, but within the supply chain. Uh, innovation, quality. We find customers demanding greater visibility. In fact, this was one of the points raised in uh, the rise, that we are have, we're seeing the advent of the socially conscientious consumer. So this requires a new type of manager. And to understand this, let's think about the difference between where we are and where we're going. If we look at the traditional supply chain manager, they're extremely good. They're functional. They're strongly orientated internally. They are primarily concerned about cost and cost minimization, critical dimensions. They focus on supply chain excellence. The supply chain that competes well is the best supply chain. Their focus is on execution. Tell me what you want. Let me do it. They talk about the need for time fencing, stability. They're inside out. Now, let me explain this term. Uh, I was first introduced this term in 2013 when I, as a new member of the APEX Board of Directors, I went to an association orientation meeting for Board of Directors members, and we were given a presentation about two different perspectives. One is inside out, which is I start with what I have, and I see if the market wants it. The other is outside in. I begin with the market needs, and I structure the organization to, f to meet those needs. This is the one that currently a lot of managers focus on. We're very functional. In essence, we understand parts per million. We understand capacity, bottlenecks. Some of us have even mem memorized Ellie Goldratt's The Goal. We strive to eliminate or simplify complexity. Complexity is cost. Complexity is instability. Complexity just makes life miserable. Well, and by the way, I'm going to ask you to note something. When I've bolded and italicized a trait, we're going to show you these are areas where sensing is critical. Number one, they're going to have to be cross-boundary coordinators. Uh, what does that mean? They're going to have to work at the interface between marketing, supply chain, finance, strategy, because it's there that we can create the value. They're going to become outcome and revenue driven. 
they're going to recognize that we compete on more than cost. And that reality, our focus is not so much on the bottom line, it, it's still there. It's on the revenue, the growth side, which is what management wants. Uh, we recognize that supply chain excellence is good, business excellence is better. Uh, a good example I've cited before is in 2010, uh, John Deere had achieved an international reputation for supply chain excellence focusing on lean in the farm equipment industry. That was great, except for a little problem. And the problem was in 2010, the agricultural sector of the American economy recovered fairly quickly. Why? Because of bad harvests in Russia, problems in Europe. Essentially, there was demand for grain. And America was in the perfect position to fill this demand. So farmers came out to buy agricultural equipment. Well, the article, which was in Business Week, described a, far, a family which had bought John Deere equipment for 60 years. That, people, is brand loyalty. So the farmer comes in in March in South Dakota, and he asked the John Deere dealer, tell me, how much would it cost to get me a combine attachment? The dealer tells him, mm, good price, love it. Then he says, when can I get it? November. Problem. South Dakota in November, most times, is snow. And the point that was raised is the supply chain was excellent in terms of lean. The corporation needed responsiveness. There was a mismatch. They're, they asked the right question. They're focusing on identifying the outcome, the goals, rather than the solutions. They're outside in. They focus on the needs of the customer, and then they figure out how do we configure the organization to meet those needs. And by the way, this was a theme we saw over and over again and beyond the horizon. They understood that measurement is communication. It's not control. That's important. But it's communication. When I measure something, I tell people it's important. When I don't, I tell people it's unimportant. By what I measure, I tell people what to focus on. It accepts complexity, eliminates complications. What's a complication? Uh, that's when someone has two part numbers for the same part. Or someone has different bills of material for the same item. Or someone has introduced an inspection in the, because in the past we had a quality problem. Even though the quality problem has gone away, the inspection still stays there. And the focus is helping managers understand and eliminate and deal with, sorry, understand and deal with complexity by helping them, helping others understand the hidden costs of complexity. And this is some other areas. The supply chain manager is deliberate. The, he focuses on optimality and their toolsmiths. They understand MRP, CRP, DDMRP. They can do tack time calculations. The new one focuses on fast decision making. They focus on robustness and they're problem masters. They define the problem that the rest of the supply chain focuses on. So this brings up an interesting question. All right, so what does sensing have to do with this? Well, maybe a good way of starting this, because I tend to be an academic professor, is by telling you what it's not. When I ask, ask people, what do you think sensing is? I got the following. Sensing is forecasting. No. Forecasting is a type of sensing but it's not what sensing is. Sensing is agility. No. Sensing is critical for agility. Agility, we're going to show you, is the product of not only sensing, but two other traits. By the way, we're not, we're not saying agility is bad. It's good, but they're not the same. Sensing is big data and analytics. No, it's not. Rather, as we're going to point out, big data and analytics are important, but not, they're not the same thing as sensing. So what is sensing? It's a system activity that seeks to enable supply chain and corporate practitioners to identify, assess, and prepare for new emerging developments. Why is this so important? Sensing is to the organization what radar is to a jet fighter. It's the ability to see downstream, 
to see an out ahead of itself. It draws on multiple sources of information, such as social media. Social media is becoming increasingly regarded as one of the major forms of sensing. It's drawing on the Internet of Things. For example, Pirelli has embedded sensors into its tires that it sells to commercial trucks, that use it on commercial trucks. Now, initially, Pirelli put Internet of Things sensors, IoT sensors, into the tires in order to find out how people were using it and what factors were affecting where and causing problems. Then it found out that, guess what? This was a magnificent service because it could now offer its customers asset management. Let's face it, trucks are expensive. You can't steal a truck without tires. It isn't done. And finally, big data. So, and this is what's important. Sensing is two parts. It's technology and it's management. If we leave any one of the two parts out, we're going to not achieve sensing. So what is sensing? It recognizes that nearly all of the data that reaches the supply chain is old. In today's environment, old de data is death. And the data we're starting to see generated by the traditional methods is unfortunately old. It's polluted. It's not clean. It doesn't tell you what's happening at the consumer level or at the user level. It's influenced by multiple factors. And it's often difficult to decipher or understand. And it's safe and it seeks to get close to the original source of the data. Let me give you an example. Okay, everyone here who's probably worked with supply chains understands the bullwhip effect. By the way, just to let you know, I, I once tried teaching the bullwhip, and I've had interesting problems because I really did bring a bullwhip into class. It causes some interesting uh, responses. The bullwhip effect really emphasizes this. And again, this is due to Laura, and I want to thank her again for this. This is a magnificent, magnificent diagram. Notice what's happening. If we start on the left-hand side, we have the consumer. The consumer interacts with the store. That interaction is instantaneous. It's not expensive. Then it gets passed to the retailers or distribution center. Now, notice what's happened. We've gone from instantaneous information, and it's taken us three days, three to ten days, to get us into the system. And it may be until we get it available for ourselves, maybe up to 20 days. Then it gets into the manufacturer's distribution center. And again, it may take them up to 20 days. And by the time we get it, it may be 45 days. And then finally, it comes to us. Now notice, take a look at the extreme left. Do you notice how the demand is really a smooth curve? Now look at the extreme right. Do you notice how that demand is all over the map? Why is that? Because of the fact that we've got other factors acting. We've got the retailer with their promotions. We've got the dis distribution center with their shipping policies. We've got the manufacturer with their ordering policies. So when I get a piece of data, I can't, dis I can't take out of it what's the consumer and what's due to these other factors. No, but here's what's really important. Take a look at the bottom. By the time it gets to someone in the supply chain, it's 20 to 50 days old. And by the time it becomes available for purchase, it may be 45 to 80 days old. It is ancient. So what is sensing? It recognizes that management now has new sources of data. It is, as pointed out previously, the organization's equivalent of radar. And by the way, the faster the change, the greater the need for radar. How many of you, I don't know if you, many of you are motorcyclists, I am, but if you're a motorcyclist and you're riding at night, there's a phrase that goes, there's a saying that goes, never override your lights. 
And the faster you're going, the more you need your lights to see ahead because you need that visibility. That's exactly what we're talking about. By the way, what are we sensing? We're sensing quality problems. We're sensing changes in demand. We're sensing changes in technology. We're sensing competitive action. We're sensing customer preference changes. We're sensing strategic threats, both within and from without our markets. Let me give you some examples. Some of these, this is another one I got from Laura, and again, thank her. Let me take introduce you to Lenovo. Lenovo makes notebooks. They are the company that took over the IBM ThinkPad. They have now developed a system where they sense what's going on in terms of consumer responses to their product. Notice, let's start with the upper left corner. Canada, a customer calls about a blue screen on a yoga. Customer B posts a Facebook article about uh, his computer's issue, adapter issues. Uh, take a look over to the United States, which is on the left-hand side. Uh, two customers talk about, present their reviews, and they mention issues with the adapters. Uh, customer E talks on the forum that they're experiencing blue screens on the on the yoga. Brazil, a uh, customer submits a service from an e-support, Lenovo.com, regarding their hard drive. Morocco, and you go around. Here's what's interesting. Instead of waiting until that's 50 to 80 days old, by which time the reputation of the product may be consumed by consumer anger, Lenovo is able to identify these issues early and to act on them in such a way that they can prevent customers from becoming angry. It's also a way of picking up the changes in demand. If we start to see demand increasing at the consumer levels, we can start thinking about ramping up production. Here's another one. This was given to me by a, by a colleague at the 2016 SAPEX conference in uh, Sun City, South Africa. Uh, he was describing this product. It's a new product developed by Rubbermaid, and it's called the, uh, the Freshworks. The idea is really n neat. It's a product for storing vegetables and produce and fruit that keeps them fresher longer. And if you think about it, for most people, this is a really neat concept. Well, what happened? Rubbermaid was sensing the consumer's responses on Facebook and on other social media, Twitter, and they found that consumers start to, were starting to complain about the fact that, you know something? We're putting our produce and our vegetables into this, and it's not working. Uh, what Rubbermaid found out is that the consumers didn't read the manual. That is to say, they didn't read that they shouldn't wash it and rather they put it in. And that what Rubbermaid was able to do was to get ahead and say, let's get out, let's tell people how to use this product properly. Think of it, if they hadn't done that, then odds are this product would have been a failure. As it is, it's now a success. Uh, if you think it's only for products, consider the following. Uh, there's an academic paper. Sometimes we academics do some neat things. Call, discussing how healthcare systems are using social media to improve delivery of product. Who would have thought it? So how about managing management? Well, let's kind of make a few points. Number one, sensing is imperfect. It is a form of forecasting. What does that mean? Failures will occur. Okay, here is why the management piece has got to be there. Failures will occur, and therefore you've got to differentiate between smart and dumb failures. I'm going to attribute this distinction to a colleague of mine by the name of Roger Callantone. And Roger one day said that people don't differentiate between those failures. Okay, since I'm an academic and sometimes I don't understand things, uh, I asked him, says, what's the difference? And he said, a dumb failure is when you do something, I tell you it's wrong, you do it, and it's wrong. A smart failure is when you do something, you've done everything right, but Murphy lives. 
Dumb failures you punish. Smart failures you shouldn't punish. You may not reward them, but you shouldn't punish them. And that became clear to me as a result of two incidences. The first one, dumb failure. In our household, we I'm a cat person. And at one point we had a cat by the name of Miss Marple. Miss Marple had claws. Miss Marple did not like to be picked up. At this point, which was many years ago, my son, who is right now a six foot three strapping hulk of a man, was a small kid of nine years old. And we've told him, as long as I can remember, don't pick up Miss Marple. Well, one day we were sitting around home and my son walks with Miss Marple being held up by the tail. My cat, this cat, is shocked. Doesn't do anything. We scream, son drops. Next day, son picks up cat. The cat's ready. Swipe. Son cries, comes up to me for sympathy, and I give him that. I said, you knew what was going to happen. Why'd you do it? What's a dumb fa What's a smart failure? Well, there's a story told out of Johnson & Johnson. In the period in the 1960s, Johnson & Johnson was run by a person who was named as the general. He had been a general in World War II. A manager who was now CEO of the company was called in to explain a $50 million marketing failure. And the way this man, person described it is classic. He walks into this enormous room where there's a big desk made of a sequoia tree, which is these enormous redwoods. And behind the general is, is a fireplace in which the rest of the tree is burning. The general pulls his glasses down, fixes this young man with his gaze, and says, you of course realize you are responsible for this company losing $50 million. At which point the person is thinking, okay, is my resume ready to go? And he says to him, what happened? And he described what happened. What, how did you plan for it? And he described all the actions that had been taken in by, by his team to plan for it. Did you follow the manual? Yeah. What did you learn from this? And he brought up all of these things that he had learned that had never been anticipated. And finally, the general said, if you were to do this again, how would you do it? And he described how he would have done it differently. The general nodded and said, you can go. The person stopped, looked at the general and said, aren't you going to fire me? He said, no. You took a chance. You failed for factors we didn't consider. And if I fired you, then the message to the rest of the organization is that they shouldn't take chances. And that's not what we want. If you're going to fail, learn from it. And that was the thing. That's the difference between smart and dumb failures. And that's why if you punish all failures, you don't get risk-taking. The new mantra of the supply chain is simple. Sense continuously, assess fast, deploy fast, fail fast, recalibrate, reapply fast. NASA is a nursing organization. There's a story told that they have a club called the Turtle Club. Why is it called the Turtle Club? Because it is based on the following saying. Behold the turtle. He only he makes progress only when he sticks his neck out. That's why the management piece has to be in. So what's the cost of not sensing? Well, it's simple. It's the organization not succeeding. And let's be honest with you. With competitors like Amazon, on the horizon, this is not too far out of reality a statement. When you have someone who's aggressive, it's, you know, as one person put it to me many years ago, a business is not a, is not a competition for the weak of heart. So what does this mean? In addition, this is why the management piece has got to be there. The technology is there, but you've got to be able to use it. And this is why I said that sensing is two parts, technology, management. What do we have to be? We have to be good at breaking down the barriers between marketing. Uh, why is this so important? Let me ask a question of this. Uh, and you can tell me informally by an email or by a vote. How many of you know who your key customer is? Because if you don't know who your key customer is, you have a problem. How do I know whether I'm doing the right things? How many of you have good relationships with engineering? 
Uh, why is engineering so important? Product design. How many of you have good relationships with, a stra with strategy? Sensing is ultimately not a supply chain activity. It is a strategic activity. How many of you have good relations with finance? This one I can potentially see. And finally, what we're saying is the barriers have to disappear because you need to use those activities sensing and you have to share your information with them. What else is going on? It also focuses on measures, and we talked about this before. Who do we see this, the, the world through? Do we see it through our own? This is a, a picture of Oliver Twist who comes up to the beetle and asks for more porridge with the words, more please, sir, which the beetle tells him that he has been fed and he's an ungrateful cur. In essence, the beetle, who is himself somewhat a few pounds over where he should be, is making judgments for the customer. Or do we see it through our customer's eyes? Let me give you an epiphany that occurred to us in Beyond the Horizon. Two years ago, we were talking with a company from Wisconsin that makes furniture, that makes uh, accessories, foster fist, faucet fittings, etc., for the bathroom and kitchen. And he described this. He said, previously, when we sold to Home Depot, Home Depot had their measures, we had our measures. Uh, we would have a four-hour meeting or whole day meeting. We would spend the first two hours figuring out whose measures to use. And at times, we would do things that Home Depot didn't like because our measures said it made sense. Well, what happened was we got a new vice president of supply chain management who said, let's start using Home Depot's measures. Guess what? Things changed. How? When they got to meet, they never look, asked the question, whose measures should they use? They only used one measure, the customers. The second thing that happened is they could show how what they were doing was affecting the customer by showing how it affected the measurements. Let's talk about the challenge of optimality. Academics are big on optimality. I have colleagues who think optimality is the most wondrous thing in the world. Well, let me give you an example of an optimal vehicle. Here's an F1 McLaren racing car. You put it on a racing track, that sucker will rip up the track. It is magnificent. It's speed. But if you put that same vehicle in a desert, it dies. What's the point of this story? Optimality is often limited. And if you change the environment in which that solution is deployed, even a bit, often the solution is a constraint. So. Optimality is, as one person put it to me, is fragile. So what should we be starting to think about? How about robustness? The fact that if the environment changes, we can still perform. Robustness is what we're hearing out of Europe in the industry 4.0. They talk about systems being self-organizing. So if you shake things up, they can respond. Uh, by the way, I said agility, remember I said ag agility and sensing are not the same? Now you start to see how agility occurs. In my mind, and in the minds of my several of my colleagues, we see agility as being the product of sensing, being able to identify developments in advance, robustness, having structures which can tolerate changes and fast management, being able to use that data, that information, and being able to interpret and act on it, knowing that at times you may not, be, you may not have the right answer. So what's the emerging challenge? It's really a challenge of leadership. One of the things that you've started to hear if you've listened to my presentations is increasingly you, the listener, is being asked to move from being a supply chain manager to being a supply chain leader. And you can see that everything here is leadership. It's not execution. And then the question I'm going to leave you with, which is one we're still struggling with here at State, is how do we go about creating a new supply chain leader? 
the person who can tap in and to realize the potential of the new supply chain and who can develop and harness the power of sensing. That is your challenge. So, what? Well, there's a great Chinese curse that says, may you live in interesting times. Interesting times were times of change. They were times when things that we used that worked used to work didn't don't work anymore. These are times when new approaches are needed. These are times when you would literally you lose your head. And this is very much an interesting time for us. We are at the advent, the introduction, the onset of a new type of supply chain. So what are we trying to say? Now, it will look different for supply chain management. The, the facts are there. The RISE talks about the Deloitte talent, later, uh, talent shortage study talks about it. The Gartner groups, others have reinforced the fact that there is evidence that the supply chain is changing. Because of this, supply chains will become more complex, more strategic, more visible, more local, more dynamic. And we need sensing. How many of you, to give you an analogy, how many of you would be willing to ride 100 miles per hour in pitch darkness, drive a car without a set of headlights? That's what you're like in the organization if you don't do sensing. And the other thing we're saying is technology, IoT, big data, social media is important, but it's not enough by itself. What's needed is a new type of management. And by the way, this is the lesson that you're starting to hear from Apex. To harness the technology, we have to change the management approach. And the question we leave you with, and one we think that you're ready to answer, are you ready? And with that, I, open, I close this part of the session, and we open up things for questions. Finally, for all of you who've been here, thank you very much. And you're starting to see where Apex and where Michigan State's Supply Chain Management Program are starting to look. Our goal is the future. Because as John Maynard Keynes once said, when he said, where would you like to live, the present or the future? And to which Keynes said, I intend to spend the rest of my life in the future. Therefore, I will spend the rest of my time today preparing for it. So, questions, and thank you again. Thanks so much, Steve. Um, if you do have a question, please use your GoToWebinar toolbar. There should be a questions box. You can type it right in there and click send, and I'll read it off to Steve. Um, so, we've got a couple questions already, Steve. Our first one comes from Brian, and Brian wants to know, is social media a driver of change or an indicator of change? It's both. I, and I'm sorry for punting, Brian, but it's both. Why is it a driver of change? Because uh, what's happening is people are now recognizing that they have a greater ability to influence business than does uh, the traditional methods. In fact, uh, I'll give you an example of a driver of change. About three years ago, I had a chance to visit the American Red Cross building in Washington, D.C. And it's a, it's a really magnificent building. And in there, I was introduced to their, quote, war room. One wall was an enormous monitor. And in that monitor, there was a social media uh, instrument cluster, uh, instrument dashboard. And what they had there, which was really interesting, is they had Red Cross, disaster, other things. And by the size and the color, you could tell whether people were positive or negatively positioned. So you saw how people mentioned the Red Cross in conjunction to um, Disasters, and what was interesting, this we were visiting this room the day after a major disaster had affected the Midwest, and they were able to see in real time how cons how the people in on the floor were viewing the Red Cross and how they were viewing it in terms of its activities, and so it's a draw. And they were saying as soon as they started to see Red Cross in red increase in size, they knew that there was a negative response. And they were saying to themselves, how do we deal with this? What's causing it? And the reason it's also an indicator of it is because we're dealing with millennials. And millennials now are using social media to talk about what they like or don't like. 
you know, it's like being unliked on social media. Some people, it's disaster. So it's both things. And that's what I want you to understand. It's an important method of communication. And what makes it so important is, had the Red Cross waited until it got the information to go from the users to the chapters, to the regions, to the Red Cross in Washington, D.C., they would be talking about weeks, months, and it would be too late. It's like you've hit a deer. Somebody tells you that there's a deer ahead, and you get an information after the fact. Uh, the analogy I think of is, in we're coming up to December 7th. There is a story told about the bombing of Pearl Harbor where the United States Navy was warned by Washington, D.C. of a likelihood of it being bombed by the Japanese. And because of solar flares, they couldn't use the Navy system. They had to use RCA telegraph. And when it got there, the person who received it in Hawaii at 5 o'clock in the morning decided it was unimportant, and he scheduled it for 7 o'clock delivery. It was literally delivered to Admiral Kimmel at 8.15 when the bombs were going off, at which point it was useless. The event had taken place. Now you're in a reaction mode, and you know what happens. So that's why I think what you had is a great question. That's why it's both. It's an indicator, and it's a driver. Good question. A really good question. Thanks. He actually has a second part to that question, and he's curious so, is, um, if you find a trend on social media, how do you discern if it's a real trend or a fake trend? Uh, monitoring. That's what these organizations are doing. Uh, you monitor them continuously. In fact, you're not only monitoring them, you're trying to look at what's going on. Are they going up? Are they going down? Are they negative, positive? Um, in some cases, what you do is if you find that you may even go out to the people directly involved and find out why they posted it. But what you're really doing is, part, by the way, and I like that question again, Brian, because remember we talked about the strategic response cycle? And we said you have to sense. Then you have to assess. And assessing is trying to validate whether you act on it, you monitor it, or you say it's not ready for prime time. So if you look at it, what you're going to do is sense, then you're going to assess it, and you may decide to talk with the people directly involved. You may decide to go out and visit them. But what you're doing is, it's faster than what you did before. And what you're doing is you're trying to assess whether that's really a system, it's a problem with the product, the experience, or whether the people are just being ornery. Good question. Well, thanks. I think we have time for one more question because we're getting close to the top of the hour. Um, this one comes from Navin. I'm sorry if I mispronounced that. But Navin wants to know, how do you sense internally if you're somebody who's in the supply chain area of the business? Oh, that, by the way, that's one reason I gave you those, met, those examples. Those examples were not deployed by marketing. They were deployed often by supply chain people, and they were deployed by people in engineering. And what's becoming really evident is that with the Internet of Things, uh, the information is being generated. And you're in a position where you can go out and get that information. In fact, it's, here's the point that's the reality. I was talking last week with a trucking company. You realize that trucking company samples its trucks something like five times, a, five or six times a minute. They have all of this data, and they don't know what to do with it. In many cases, they're willing to give it to anyone within the organization that says, can I, can I look with it? Because often, in many cases, what you're doing is you're trying to make sense of the data. And the, many organizations nowadays with things like Internet of Things, big data, they remind you of the punchline to the old joke. You know, did you ever hear the story about the dog that chased a car? It finally caught it and didn't know what to do with it. And that's what many companies are now doing. And in many cases, they're making that data available to anyone who can help them understand it. And that anyone can be a business person, a marketing person, a researcher like myself, or someone in supply chain. And in fact, because of the fact we have to always think in the future, uh, there should not be a reason why we wouldn't want to get that information early. That's one reason we want to start working with marketing. We want to tear down the walls and convince the organization that we need to have that data, not to have it filtered, contorted, trans transfigured, transformed, whatever convolution by everything else. We need to see the raw data. 
Great. Well, thank you, Steve. And to our audience, that's all the time we have today for questions. Steve, could you go to the next slide, please? Sure. Thank you. My apologies. Oh, no. If you need more information, I, I'm around to contact. Uh, one of the things we're going to tell you is that Michigan State University is really, we love working with practitioners. We listen to them. If you have questions, stories, please share them with us. Um, we would like to help you. We, 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 we have a proposal for the listeners. Work with us. Help us to create research and new employees that can help your company not only survive, but thrive. And then let us work with you to help you become one of the survivors, not the survivors, but the real winners in this new generation. The reality is when there's a change, what went on in the past is no longer going to determine the future, and companies that were losers in the past can become very much winners in the future. So let's work together, and I'm willing to share and discuss anything that you've heard about here. Well, thanks, Steve. It's a nice offer. And similarly, if your question that you sent in today was not answered, you can shoot him an email at Elm melnick at msu.edu, and I'm sure he'll get back to you quickly with a great answer for Thank you. you. Um, well, I'd like to thank Steve for his time today and all of you for attending today's APEX webinar. Uh, please consider taking our short survey after this webinar. I think it's about five questions. Tell us how we did and how we can improve for the future. And we thank you in advance for your time on that. All content and materials included in this edition of the APEX webinar are the property of APEX and Michigan State University and are protected by the United States and international copyright laws. All rights are reserved. Thank you so much and have a great rest of your day.